Okay, welcome everyone. We're excited to have you with us today. We are here with David Baskovich, and we're going to hear his story about how he became the CEO and founder of Milio. Um, you're going to be able to ask some questions, and we also had some questions that were sent in earlier to us. So this is your opportunity to ask live. Uh, my name is Lori Rubin. I'm happy to introduce you to David. Uh, he was the CTO of Microsoft for 23 years, and then he founded Milio in January of 2012. He's known in the technology industry for his contributions to the development of innovative software solutions. Uh, we do have Angela Andrew with us today. Uh, she's well versed in Miley photos. You probably know her from other webinars as well. So she'll be in the background answering some of your questions as well. So David, welcome. Thanks so much for joining us today on this special presentation. We're really excited to have you with us. Um, would you mind starting out sharing with us what inspired you to start Miley photos and how you wanted to change the way the world remembers. Yeah, maybe I'll start by talking about myself for a few minutes. That'd be great. Okay, Please so um, <clears throat> so I started programming in 66. I always have to say 1966, not 1866. And in those days, nobody knew what a computer was, except if they read science fiction. Now, the interesting thing about science fiction is that the computers in the science fiction books were all like alive. Like if you think of 2001, A Space Odyssey with Hal, I mean, you know, that's not a computer the way that I encountered them when I started programming. Anyways, I wrote, and that got me started thinking even then about how a computer could help us remember and do things better. And I wrote one of the first three email systems in the world in 1971. Uh, did some other things, including a startup in the 70s, um, joined 3Com, um, and then I joined Microsoft in 1986, and I was there for almost 25 years, so that's a, a long time. And then after doing some other things, um, I started Milio in 2012. Now, when I was in university in the 70s, one of the reasons that I didn't end up getting a doctorate, and therefore I can't say I'm Dr. Vaskovich, is because I wanted to do a thesis on the topic of human memory and how memory is organized and what it would take for computers to be able to help us with our memories. And the university was adamant that that wasn't an appropriate topic for computers and that if I wanted to do a thesis, I should do it on databases, programming languages, or networking or operating systems. So I said, no, thank you. But um, so it's a problem that I've been interested in for a long time. And uh, so there, there are two ways to think about the problem of memory. I'm sure there are many. Uh, one of them is, you know, let's say we're all out somewhere, maybe we're driving and we hear a piece of music and none of us can remember the name of the song. I'm sure that's happened to all of you. And then you sort of like, God, what is that song? What is that song? It bothers you. And then you wake up in the middle of the night and you remember it. Like, how did the brain do that? We don't really know. But the other side of it, which kind of goes with, it's, it's all part of having too much information is, um, so in 1996 at Microsoft, I was literally sitting there thinking about why would anybody need a high-end computer? Like, you know, when we rolled out Windows in the beginning at Microsoft and what became the Microsoft Office, computers were barely fast enough to run Word and Excel. But by 1996, even the cheapest computer you could buy could run Office. So why would anybody need more? There aren't enough gamers in the world. There aren't enough programmers. And then it came to me, digital photography. Now, in those days, if I gave a speech or a presentation and said digital photography, everybody would turn their ears off. Like, you know, when people turn their ears off, they stop listening. But when they stop listening, it doesn't matter what you say next. And the reason they would turn their ears off is they all thought they knew you know, photography is what you do with the camera, 24 or 36 pictures at a time. Now there are kids who don't even know what that means, 24 or 36 pictures at a time. And digital was what you did with your computers. And in those days, there was no internet. So even if you had a computer at home, you didn't necessarily use it every day. You know, you'd 
do I need to write a big essay? Do I need to do a budget? Uh, do I need to do a presentation? And then I'm going to use PowerPoint. And otherwise, my computer is going to sit there and I'm not going to use it. So if you fast forward, um, you know, well, even in, even then, the average person took 5,000 pictures in a lifetime. And that doesn't sound like very much because many of us have more than 5,000 pictures on our camera roll on our phone. But if I gave you a box with 5,000 slides, prints, and negatives in it and told you you have to organize it, that's a big job. I mean, even then, that was a lot of pictures. Well, um, you know, I went to Montana in the year of the eclipse. It's about four or five years ago. And uh, there were two of us. And I had two cameras. And the other person had a phone. And I took 5,000 pictures and she took 6,000 pictures on her phone just because it's so easy to do. And so now the question, there's two related questions here. One is, how do I find the picture I need? But more importantly, you know, how do I organize the memories of my life? Because as we get older, the memories become more and more important. You know, eventually they, in a sense, they're not just a record of our lives in some ways. It's not that they are our lives, but they're they're a form, they're a version of our lives. So that's how I, I got interested in that question. To me, the question isn't how do you have a photo manager in the simple sense of the word. Uh, my question is, how do you create a record of your life for yourself, for your friends, and as a legacy? That's great. Yeah. Um, David, there's a few questions that are coming in. Do you want to take those as we go along here, or do you want to share your screen first? I think what, I, what I'd like to do is um, show people how I use Mylio. That'd and be great. You, you can call it a demo if you'd like, but it's it's a, okay, it is a demo, and but it's not, it's how I use Mylio, and that, it'll become very obvious how memories fit into that. And then we can go back and take questions. And in doing that, I'm going to hit on, not all, but some of the questions. I'm not going to talk about how you use a NAS or stuff like that, which I'm happy to talk about later. But I certainly will talk about things like how do documents fit in and stuff like that. That sounds great. Okay, we'll start sharing your screen then. Okay, I'm going to share my screen. Okay, so this is my Milio. And what you see here is my life calendar. Now, if you, even if you are, if you're not a Milio user, if you've only started to use it, this doesn't really look like a calendar. I mean, it's it's got years in it. This is what's called decades view. And it's uh, something that exists in our calendar and not, not any other calendar that I know of. But it is a calendar. Now, I'll say this. It doesn't have any of my dentist appointments. It doesn't have any flight numbers. But... If I look here, my mother died in 2021, uh, sorry, in 2019, and we unveiled her tombstone in 2021 at the end of COVID. And there was a life event there, which you probably could read on the screen. And there's there's the event. So, you know, just by tapping on that, I was able to see the pictures from the event. Now, if I go back out and go into 2021, now it looks more like a calendar. Here you see months. And then if we go to the month that that event took place in, um, here you see an event that says Peter Meinke, Steve Gribble, Kingston. Okay, so let's tap. I'm going to just click on that. Now, remember, I told you that I wrote the first email system in the world in 1971. I was working for a guy named Peter Meinke who was the vice president of the University of Toronto. And there he is. And because I have face tags turned on, I can turn them on or off. Okay, now they're off. Now they're on. You can tell which one is Peter Meinke. Uh, he's the tallest. So I, you know, I was in Toronto for the unveiling of the tombstone and I hadn't seen Peter for uh, years, decades. And so he was in Ottawa and we drove to Kingston, which is a city between Toronto and Ottawa. And we met, and there's the friend I have had the longest. I'm very careful not to say he's my oldest friend. Um, and then there's another guy who was working on the team when we were writing software. So um, that's kind of cool. 
And, um, you know, now if we take another step and go into the month of October, now it really looks like a calendar. And you can see some of the things I did. You know, there's the unveiling of the tombstone. I was also there for a wedding. Um, and I went to my favorite restaurant, FK Kitchen. And okay, because I do this demo more than once, I remember his name, but until recently, I never remembered his name, but it doesn't matter because Milio, as soon as it saw the picture, it tagged the face. And so I was reminded that his name is Frank Parhisgar. Okay, now here's an embarrassing admission. Um, sometimes I'll be at an event, let's say a party or a conference, and I'll meet somebody and I should know their name but I don't, and I have my phone with me. So I'll find an excuse to take their picture. And then when they're not looking, I'll wait till Milio sees the picture, which takes a few seconds. And then a few seconds later, Milio will tag their face and I know their name. Like, okay, uh, maybe I shouldn't have admitted that. Now you can tell everybody <laughs> about it. Okay, so that's, it's a calendar, but what about this decades view? So if we start, Scrolling back, whoops, okay. So we're scrolling back through the years. And as I do this, at some point, if people don't know what's coming, they start to wonder how old I am. Because now we're getting back into the 50s and the 40s and the 30s. Wait a minute, you know, David can't be that old. And I'm not, this goes back to when my mother was born in 1923. And that's a form of her birth certificate. Now, if we go a little bit forward, here's an event, Shula sledding in 1934 when my mother was 11 years old. Now, if we go there, another something you'll notice, um, these pictures have dates on them. And this picture of her sledding, the one on the right, actually both of them, uh, it says that they were taken in winter of 1934. Uh, so, this is something that <clears throat> Milio does that no other photo manager that I know of does. We have what are called fuzzy dates. So, you know, my mother's not around anymore, but even at no time in her life could she have told me the year, month, day, hour, minute, and second that that picture of her sledding was taken. She just couldn't. So why would I be forced to put in year, month, day, hour, minute, second when she just didn't know? So the most that she would have known, she probably might not even remember the month. She might, but she would certainly, she remembered the year. And then here's another thing, Milio recognized her face. Now I have over 10,000 pictures of my mother and there's no way that I tagged them one by one. And interestingly enough, Milio is able to recognize faces for a person from when they're a baby to, in my mother's case, till she was 97. Now, you have to help it a little. So the first time it sees a face, you have to tell it who it is. And if we're talking about a human lifetime, a long human lifetime, like in my mother's case, I probably would have had to identify her somewhere in her 30s, 40s, or 50s. That would carry her through most of her adult life maybe sometime in her 80s, and probably sometime as a teenager. And then sometimes, depending upon how different you looked as a baby or a young child, I might have to do one more time, four times to catch a lifetime. It's something you kind of do as you go along. Okay, so um, if we go forward, like who would have guessed that my mother rode a motorcycle on the beach in 1947. Like my mother on a motorcycle? No, come on, that's somebody else. But no, that's her. Okay, so if we keep going forward, so there's an event here, David Bourne, that's me. And I purposely don't have the faces visibly tagged. So there's another place where I can Milio can acknowledge who's in the picture, but I asked it not to show the face tags. And um, okay, I could open the floor for questions to see if anybody can guess which one is me, but I don't think it's a very difficult question. So there I am as a baby. Now here's an interesting question, which I'm not gonna ask people individually, but 
when I ask people, so do you have a picture of yourself as a baby? Okay, almost everybody says yes. About a quarter of the people will tell me it's in a box or it's in an album. And often they'll say, I don't even know which box or which album, but I probably could find it. Uh, that's an okay answer. Then another, about a quarter from my experience will say, I had all those pictures scanned and we're gonna come back to that topic in a minute, but um, so it's on a disc on my computer at home, or it's in Google Photos or Apple Photos, and probably I could find it, maybe not, okay? Then another quarter will say, no, no, I mean, I even know where it is. It's uh, in a folder in a place that I identified, and it's on my computer, it's on my phone, and almost nobody says I have this picture with me all the time. So let's just back up for a minute. So. I have about 700,000 items in Mylio. Items means photos, documents, uh, every presentation I've ever given, but most of it is pictures. And um, Mylio, so me, how I use it, I have five vaults. Those are just computers with very big disks. And so I have uh, three vaults at home and two vaults at work. And Mylio keeps all those vaults in sync all the time. So if I take a picture at a picture, like if I take a picture on my phone, the original will automatically end up in all those vaults. And um, I know one of the questions was, is if you have two vaults, which one is uh, the master? And the answer is yes. There's no master. They're all masters. Okay. So it's what's called peer-to-peer. -peer. That's a technical term. Peer means equal. All of those vaults are equal. And so I'm I'm not really worried that um, something's going to happen to my home and my office at the same time, and all the computers in all those places are going to be destroyed. So I feel pretty good spending zero minutes per month on backup. Zero, I just don't do it. It's done for me automatically. Now, the other thing that's really interesting, though, is um, I, so I have uh, phones. I have more than one. I have tablets and I have notebook computers and they don't have my originals. So what they have are what we call previews. We sometimes call them optimized images and I call them magic miniatures. So a magic miniature has three characteristics. It's very small. So all 700,000 items that I have fit on my one terabyte iPad and take less than half the storage. All 700,000 items fit on my one terabyte iPhone and take less than half the storage. All 700,000 items fit on my two terabyte notebook computer and take less than half the storage. So that's the first thing that's true about those optimized images or magic miniatures. The second thing that's true is they are indistinguishable from the ret from the original on a retina class display. So if I'm sitting beside you as an air on an airplane and want to show you that picture of my mother sledding, you're going to, from your perspective, see the same thing as if I was on a vault showing you the original. They're editable. And we preserve full color fidelity. So let's say that like right now I'm working on a book for my daughter. She turned 40 and um, I hope she's not listening because it's supposed to be a surprise. And um, and so I work in that book wherever I can. It's a huge project. And so let's say that I look at a picture and because I care about how it looks, maybe it's a little overexposed or underexposed or I want to, you know, crop it. But all, color fidelity is completely preserved when the same edits are applied on my big computer because I need the originals to produce a high enough quality image for a book. The magic miniatures are great for working on a screen, any screen. They're not great for producing wall prints or books. So that's why you still want the original. So that's how I use Mylio. And I'm just saying that because you're sort of getting a feeling for how many pictures I have. And I just have them with me all the time, everywhere I go, whether I have internet or not. Okay, so if we keep going forward, so my father was killed in a plane crash in 1966. And sometimes I forget the year, you'd think I wouldn't. Um, but I just look in my Malio and there it is. 
And there's the event. And so you can see some web clips and you can see a couple of pictures, but there were no survivors. So there wasn't really much to take a picture of. Now, here's an interesting thing. Emilio does documents. It does. And um, I have to be careful how I say that because a lot of people, when I say that, will say, oh, so Miley is a document manager. Well, I'm not going to say it's not a document manager, but people automatically assume if it's a document manager, it doesn't do a very good job with photos. It's sort of like in a funny kind of way, um, when Steve Jobs introduced the iPhone and it had the camera built in, I had an argument with somebody fairly famous, I'm not going to tell you who it is, who said to me, I bet you love the idea of a phone built into a camera built into a phone, and I bet you like Swiss Army knives. And he said, you wait and see a year from now, everybody is going to think that it's the stupidest thing Apple ever did, having a camera on every phone. But if you go to the Apple website now and look up the page for the phone, it's not an ad for the phone, it's an ad for the camera. Like, why do people buy new phones? Because they want to get a better camera. So by the same token, there's nothing that says that if I have a single place that holds all my memories, not one place for my Word documents, another place for my presentations, another place for my photos, maybe another place for my videos, why can't I have one place that holds all my memories and still have it do a great job for each type of memory? That's Milio. So if we look at this document here, so this is Boeing sent an engineer to the crash site. He wrote a trip report on a typewriter, on paper. And about six years ago, he scanned the trip report and turned it into a PDF document and then sent it to families of survivors and my sister got it and she sent it to me as an email attachment. And using the share framework on my iPhone, when I was looking at the document, I tapped the little box with the arrow coming out of it, you know, for sharing. And I picked Milio and then I forgot about it because I was really busy. And about a week later, I was on an airplane with no internet. And here it was in the event because it had the correct date. And when I tapped on the arrow, I got to read it. Now I'm going to move this over because it's on another screen, but there is the document. And I was able to read it, even though I had no internet connection. Okay, so um, I want to make sure I finish. We're still on track. I want to have lots of time for questions, but I want to keep going for a few minutes. Okay, so if we keep going forward, so now I'm going to ask you a rhetorical question. Okay, so Miley is about memories, but we do documents. How is that document, the crash trip report, not an important memory? It's like one of the more important memories in my life. Why wouldn't I want to have that in there with all my other memories? You know, so I want to have this picture of me graduating, but I also want to have... Um, my daughter's fifth grade report card. I want them both. You could think of this as another form of peer. These are peers, they're equally important. They're all memories and I wanna have them all in one place. I wanna have them all with me and I wanna be able to manage, organize and find them and share them in the same way. So that's what Milio does. And if we keep going forward, so for example, when was the first time I went to Africa? Well, you know, I went on to Africa and there's all of, by the way, another thing about Milio, everything you're seeing here, every picture, every video, every document on, the, on your computers is stored in the file system. It's stored in files and folders. Now you don't have to be aware of that, but if you are aware of it, you'll realize that means, first of all, files and folders will be here forever. And, Anything that's in a file can be accessed by a wide variety of other tools. So I can work on a document. If I go to a Word document and tap on it, I'll be in Word on my computer. If I go to a photograph, I like using Photoshop on my computer, I'll be in Photoshop. But on my iPad, I'll be in Affinity, another photo editor. 
Um, and if I tap on a PowerPoint, so everything you're seeing here is in the file system. And there is a folder for that Africa trip. And it's in a folder hierarchy. You know how complicated those get, particularly with 700,000 items. The calendar is the best friend of the folder system. So here is the trip. There's the pictures from the trip. And as we get farther into it, it'll feel like Africa. Oh, it is Africa. Yep. Now, if we pick this picture and right click in it, we get a menu. And I'm going to say, show it to me in the folder. So okay, now I'm in the folder. Now, you can't necessarily tell there's more pictures because there's an event and a, a filter got applied. However, I'm going to go up here. See up here, it tells me the name of the folder. And now you can see that that folder is one of many folders for a folder called King's Pool. It's one of the places we stayed in the trip. King's Pool is one of three folders in a folder called Botswana. That's one of the countries we went to on the trip. And Botswana is one of uh, several folders for Africa, September 2002. So there's a slideshow, but there's also all the places I went, Botswana, Cape Town, Paul, uh, a friend of mine, when we went to Zambia. Now, if we go up a level, this is all my Africa trips. Okay. If we go up one more level, this is uh, all of my trips. Now, by the way, if we go over here, I'm just going to get a little bit into details. I see a folder tree. For years, people have asked us to have a folder tree, and now we do. And I can pop out any one of these folders. So there's one called industry. I can collapse it um, and so on. So there's trips, there's Africa trips, but I can also go back to this other view. So if you don't, if you like trees, you got them. And if you like this other view, you've got them and, uh, and so on. Okay, so now if I go back to the calendar, um, Whoops, I went to the wrong place, sorry. Back to the calendar, go back out, and here we are in the calendar. Okay, now, to me, the calendar is the most memory-oriented view. It's the one that I use the most, but here's another one. Okay, this is the map. I guess I travel a lot. And I happened to be looking before at, so if I move my cursor over here, Toronto, I grew up in Toronto. And if we zoom in, you'll see the places that I've taken pictures in Toronto. Now, another thing I can do, um, so if I go up here, oops, I wanna be down here actually. So I wanna apply a filter I'm going to do a custom filter and I'm going to type in um, I typed in my daughter's name. See if I typed it correctly. Yep. Oh, it's slow today. Come on. Oh, that's strange. Let's try this one. Oh, okay, that's all the places I went with the guy I work with, Rich Harrington. I must have typed my daughter's name wrong. Oh, yeah. Um, because it's oh, yeah. Well, I didn't go to all those places with her, so I don't know why that is. Let's try uh, another one. Um, just going to type in my son's first name. Okay, those are all the places I've been with somebody called Theodore. That's just lazy. I could have typed Theodore Vaskovich. And you can do complex searches. For example, I could look for all the places I've been with Theodore and Rachel, or Theodore and Rachel and not Helen. So Helen is my youngest daughter, or any combination like that. Now, one thing, so, okay, so that's the calendar. And I really like the calendar view. It's one of my uh, favorite views.
So then we also have a people view. I'm not going to spend long in there, but for instance, uh, okay, let's try this again. So I mentioned I was making that book for my daughter. So if I type in Rachel, it'll show me all the Rachels. And there's Rachel Vaskovich, and I only have 10,980 pictures of her. Or 10,980 pictures that she's in. So this is her life. And when I want to make a book, I can scan through, I can put filters on it to look for only five-star pictures, and I can pick out the pictures that I want and put them into an album. So um, yeah, that's another thing we can do. And all of that tagging was done automatically for me. Okay, so now we're near the end and I wanna hit a little bit more in documents and then I'll open up the floor for questions. So here's an interesting thing. Um, so I'm on a street in Istanbul and I have an RX-10 camera. It's a Sony camera. It's a consumer camera. You can't change the lens. It has a lot of zoom. And funny thing about Sony is they decided to put the knob that controls the focus mode on the front of the camera. Like who puts controls on the front of a camera, the top, the back, sometimes the sides, not the front. And I must've bumped it because all of a sudden um, my cameras, all the pictures I take are blurry and I have no data and I have my phone. So I went to Milio and I typed RX10, that's the model number and Half a second later, there's the folder with the manuals and there's the manual. I reading the manual three minutes later, that's how long it took me to find it. I figure out what's going on, flip the switch and everything's working again. Now, here's an interesting thing about this um, search. If I do the same search on my Mac or on my Windows machine using Explorer or Spotlight, on a vault where all my items are, so I'm searching in the file system, even on a fast computer, that search will take three minutes. You just sit and wait. But if I do the same search, for example, I wanna find my red cross card because I wanna know my blood type, that search takes half a second. All the, the searches you saw on the map took half a second. All the searches take half a second. They're just like essentially you can't time them. They're instantaneous. Okay, so let's talk about documents for one more minute. So um, you know, I, I can never keep up with my reading. So what I used to do is when I saw an article that I wanted to read, I would tear the pages out of the magazine, staple them together, and put them in a pile. And then if it was in a book, I don't want to tear pages out, so I would either myself or get somebody to do it for me, go to a copy or make a copy of all the pages of the article or the chapter, staple it together, add it to the pile. And then I would get on an airplane with a bag of paper. And I would measure the success of the trip by how much lighter the bag was at the end of the trip versus the beginning. It was kind of, a, it's kind of funny in retrospect. Now, Dropbox, and the iPad came out the same year. And so I, um, I thought, okay, I'm gonna start to do this with an iPad. Now there's two problems with that. Uh, one problem is that Dropbox doesn't store the documents on the iPad. Instead, it stores um, a pointer. And if you don't have internet, you can't open the pointer. The other problem is uh, this is the view you get. It's a file system view. Like I, I don't find this, it doesn't do anything for me. I mean, if I had no choice, it might be okay. Um, yeah, it's like file names, yuck. As opposed to now I put all that stuff in my reading pile. That's my reading pile. That's my actual reading pile. I'm gonna be on an airplane tomorrow. And I, if I have any of my devices with me, that reading pile will be with me. And by the way, when I'm finished reading an article, I can either delete it or, you know, all those folders I showed you, I can store it in folders um, and get back to it later whenever I want. Okay, so on that note, I want to show you one last example. I want to come back to the topic of memories. 
So I mentioned that my father died when I was 13. I didn't mention the age. And so my oldest memory of my father is him and me sitting on a beach just north of Toronto. But I never knew if the memory was real. Like, you know, a lot of our memories turn out to be real and a lot don't. And then when we first announced Milio, which was a much weaker product in those days, uh, we had this guy, Scott Kelby, who's a fairly famous guy. He wrote a lot of the original books on Photoshop and Lightroom. And he showed up in New York for the announcement. He lives in Florida. And he was all emotional. And I asked him why. And he said, well, you told me that if I used Milio, I would find pictures I didn't even know I had. So he said, I was on an airplane and I came across a picture from when my daughter was much younger and I suddenly found myself crying. I thought, okay, it happened to him. I wonder if it'll ever happen to me. And then about two weeks later, I was on an airplane going through pictures. And so here's a picture of me, my sister and my mother. You can probably tell which one is me. I turned off the face tags. Now, if I go over here, there is the same picture, but now my father's in the picture. There's a picture of my dad. There's a picture on the beach. And there's the memory. It was real. It changes the way I remember. And if you use it, it'll change the way you remember too. Okay, so why don't we start going through some questions? Yeah, David, um, I just want to say also that your emphasis on documents is so well done because we often think of just photos and videos, but documents such as you know birth announcements and things like that are just as important. So thank you for sharing that. My pleasure. Um, we, we've got a question from John. He's asking, will David be speaking about the early days of Milio and the evolution of the software and team? I'd be interested in hearing some of that. Um, so what the first part was, will I be speaking about the evolution of the software and team? Was that the last part? Yes. Speak about the early days of Milo. Yeah, so in the early days, uh, you know, the company has, has actually been around the same size, more or less from the beginning. I mean, it took us a little while to ramp up, but I think in the beginning, we had about 20 people. Now we have about 30 um, there are very few people left from the early days. We've been at it for 10 years, and I think some people got kind of burnt out. Uh, one of the founders was a guy named Mosin, who I had worked with at Microsoft. He was a brilliant developer and also had a pretty good sense for how software should really work. Um, and uh, the team was always fairly close-knit. Um, you know, let's say that I go back, uh, go into the calendar. Whoops. I keep hitting the wrong button. Okay, so 2012, Team Building Hawaii. So there are some of the early people. We The first thing we did was we went in a team building event to Hawaii. Now that might sound like an extravagant thing to do for a startup. If you notice the date, we went in November at a time when people don't normally go to Hawaii. And we went to Hilo, which is on the rainy side of Hawaii. So if you're going to Hawaii to get a lot of sun, don't go to Hilo. You're probably going to get a lot of rain. But the thing we were able to do was take a lot of great pictures. And so everybody got to understand the problem of organizing all the pictures they took of the volcano and um, lava. We got out to go out on, a, we'll probably see it in a minute, some lava fields where there was lava flowing. We went up to um, visit a volcano when you got up, not a, not a volcano observatory, and it was up at about 12,000 feet, so it was a little bit hard to breathe. And then we practiced making uh, pictures with flashlights in the air. In those days, the company was called Milo, not Milio. And uh, 
There's a group, there's a picture of most of the original team. So I don't know if that helps or not. Um, yeah, it was a fun trip. I still remember it well. That's great. I also want to say the current team is wonderful. The people that work for Milio are passionate about the software and um, they're just a great group of people. So I just want to put that in there. <laughs> Um, okay, here's some questions for you, David. Uh, first of all, I want to say I absolutely love Milio and tell family and friends about it. I'm wondering if in future updates, if there will be the opportunity to share photos with family and friends like Apple Photos has. Yeah, this summer. Awesome. It's probably the number one request I get from just users, friends, family. I want to be able to share my pictures on the web. Uh, you know, my my oldest daughter told me so I have two grandkids. She's the mother. And she says, the main reason I take pictures these days is to share them. Everybody wants to see pictures of the grandkids. So yeah, we're in the final stages of doing web sharing. Fantastic. Okay, another question. I have approximately 60 to 70,000 photos and videos combined, all scanned into SSD drives all the way back from the 1940s, black and whites to iPhone photos. I have the free version of Milio so far. I haven't figured out how to use it yet, but would be would it be a useful tool to organize my pictures from these drives? I also have an iMac computer, but all my pictures are on SSD drives. Thank you, Paul. Yeah, so I mean, Milio is the perfect tool. You know, what I tell people, I'm going to answer the question directly, but I want to say something about scanning. Um, almost every person I talk to, and it's not just older people, young people as well, if I ask them, do you have boxes of slides, negatives, and prints? The answer is always yes. If they're older, they might be their own pictures. If they're younger, it's their parents' pictures or their grandparents' pictures. In fact, a friend was telling me just yesterday that they're realizing they need to get their pictures scanned sooner rather than later because they want their grandparents to tell them who's in the picture. Now, another thing I'll say about scanning, it sounds like this particular question already has done the scanning. But one reason people don't scan in the beginning is because they're a little bit intimidated by the task of organizing all the pictures. But I'll tell you that just scanning alone is a good thing. Pictures deteriorate. If you just let them sit there, they'll deteriorate. And something could also happen to them. Now, if you have your pictures scattered across several disks, my recommendation would be to consolidate them. So you can buy a five terabyte disk for $100, more or less. Five terabytes is a lot of storage. If five terabytes isn't enough, you can buy a 10 terabyte drive or even a 22 terabyte drive. And like my entire library is about 12 terabytes. So you can buy these disks, they're very inexpensive. And I mean, Milio can certainly handle multiple drives. Now, one difference between, so one thing we've done that I think is exciting for people faced with, you know, how should I do this is the free version of Milio now handles an unlimited number of pictures on a single device. Now the preferred way to handle SSDs is to have them be their own device, but you can't do that in the free version. So it is possible to, have the uh, device plugged in so it looks like it's on the computer, but then it has to be plugged in all the time. So there's two answers to this question. If you're using the free version, what I would recommend is buying, uh, I recommend this anyways, buying a drive which you can use to consolidate all your pictures on. You can still keep the SSDs as a form of backup and then uh, consolidate everything into uh, one drive and then use Milio to start organizing the drive. And if you have um, that drive, that becomes a vault. And then I would recommend that fairly early in the process, you set up a second vault. And uh, I know there's a question that comes later on. I have two vaults. Is that good or bad? It's definitely good. Three is even better. Which one is the master? There is no master. They're all, they're all the same. Does that answer the question? Yep, that, that should answer that. That's great. Uh, here's a question. I love to sync. I would love to sync my phone and my wife's phone to Milio, but she takes so many pictures. I end up with screenshots. And what do you think of this project? 
Should I grab one while at the market pictures? How would you deal with extraneous stuff and not pollute your Mylio library? Yeah, that's a good question. It's probably not a good idea for me to say, tell her to stop taking so many pictures. <laughs> I have a feeling that doesn't work. It reminds me of another question I got from a, a, a user in Holland who told me that he uses an iPhone and his wife uses an Android phone and he wants to stay married. So, you know, it's another question. How do you, so with Mylio, all those issues go away. And the, the, the simple answer, there are a number of possible answers. The simplest answer is to use a simple folder system. So the wife's pictures can all be in one folder and the husband's pictures can be in another folder. And then you don't have to look at the other folder if you don't want to. So then beyond that, you can start to use filters. You could have quick filters. You could set up a category. A category could be things like documents versus pictures. It could also be travel. It could be personal versus uh, private versus work. But it could also be wife's pictures and husband's pictures. And then if you apply a quick filter, you can uh, either select or uh, exclude pictures. So you could use the quick filter to say, I want to see all the husband's pictures, or I want to see everything except the husband's pictures. So there's a lot of different ways to do this in Mylio once you get the pictures in there. Right. Matt is asking, what general tips can you share for deciding on a folder structure and naming convention? Wow, that's a big topic. Yeah. Um, so first of all, I'm going to say that before Mylio, the folder structure was critical. It's still very important, but it, it sort of becomes less important because there's so many different ways of organizing and finding pictures in Mylio. So for example, when I did that book for my daughter, I was relying on face tags and face tagging is completely automatic. If I'm looking for all the pictures taken in a particular place, I'm depending on geotags, which in the case of a phone are automatic. In the case of a camera, you have to do some work to get the geotags in there. The calendar itself, like sometimes I forget my own folder structure, so I use the calendar to find things. That's what I did with the Africa trip. Now, in terms of the folder system, um, so I'll show you my folder structure. Um, so at the very top, this is not me, this is Mylio. I have camera rolls, Mylio inbox, and media. So like when I share something into Mylio, it shows up in the inbox. And then the camera rolls, the way I have this organized is I have a camera roll for every camera. And okay, now if we drop down a level, I have a folder for things that they're just action, like, you know, I have theater tickets, whatever. And if I drop into that, um, you know, it's got like a computer history to be moved. So this is something I need to figure out. It, it should be filed somewhere else. Uh, these are wallpaper pictures um, and so on. Okay. Then I have a folder that I'm going to come back to. It's called Away. I have a demo folder that I haven't used for a long time because I just demo with my own library, but I have two or three interesting demos in there. And I'm, I'm tempted to do those, but I'm not going to because then we won't get any more questions. They're kind of fun. Then I have a big folder called In Process. And these are large sets of pictures that I know I eventually have to organize. And so they're, they're sitting here waiting. Some of these folders have multiple folders within them. Um, so like here's one. Uh, old pictures taken by my cousin. There is 2,183 pictures spread across 53 folders. Now, you know, in one way, these are sort of pushed off to the side. So how would I find them? But on the other hand, they I still can look things up by face. I can still look things up by time. I can still look things up on the map. So, you know, it's a uh, one way. Um, then I have a folder called keep, which is things I don't necessarily want to show, but I don't want to get rid of. And then I have one called uh, knowledge. I'll come back to that because I want to say the two that are the most relevant are show and reading. Reading I already talked about. It's my reading pile. Show is um, pictures I want to show. And so they're also organized by trips, school events pictures of a dog, visits and meetings, and so on. But again, the calendar is the main way I get to these things. But, and I already showed you, if we look at trips, for example, 
uh, trips are organized by geography, Africa trips, Arctic and Antarctica trips around the world, Asia trips, Canada trips, conferences and event trips, and so on. Okay, now if we back out, okay, new is, I just took pictures, I'm way behind for a variety of reasons. So these are pictures I've taken in the last two or three months that I want to look through and maybe rate and call, and then they're going to go into one of the other folders. So this is new. It's uh, the, I call this the feel guilty folder. Unless it's empty, then you feel proud. Okay, now we get to what in some ways is the most interesting folder in terms of folder structure. This is, I call it knowledge. I have books in here. I have articles. So the articles and papers folder is huge. Like here's reviews of applications. Um, like if I go farther down, uh, here's one on software architecture. And then inside there, there's one in application architecture, APIs, uh, autonomous machines, behavior trees. I mean, these are just articles. You know, there's another one called Lives and Feelings, which is stories. You know, a lot of the stories that make you laugh or cry. There is investment strategies. These are just basically articles that I want to keep. But I almost never look them up by going into the folder. I look them up by by uh, words in the uh, document. But the folder is useful because it cluster things together. So if I find an article on investment strategies and then I go into that folder, I'll see other related articles on investment strategies. Okay, then um, also in the knowledge folder. Um, so for example, um, I have all the papers that I've written and I have a folder on the house. So that has pictures from various houses, a chair that was broken, my boat, uh, house painting, just house related stuff. You know, it's uh, identity cards and registration. So I have passports and driver's licenses and uh, credit cards. I mean, everything is in here. It's just, I have access to it all the time. Okay, the last thing I wanna show, um, a way. So, okay, I'm sort of hesitating because this is a slightly complicated topic. Uh, when I'm on a trip, a high percentage of the time, there's very limited internet. Now, where could this be true? The Four Seasons in Beverly Hills. Because Beverly Hills, Los Angeles is not a big city. It's not technically sophisticated. And the Four Seasons is not a very expensive hotel. So why would you expect to have good internet? But I don't want to lose pictures. Like I went on a trip to Japan and imagine, you know, let's say I took a lot of pictures on my phone and then near the end of the trip, somebody stole the phone. I just lost all my pictures. I'm never going to be able to get them back. So I have four or five devices that are my travel devices, like my two phones, uh, two of my iPads, uh, two of my laptop computers. And the um, away folder on those devices is set up to want originals. It's like a mini vault. So when I take a picture and import it, it automatically gets copied over to all the other away devices I have with me. And then if I lose one of the devices, it doesn't matter, even though there was no internet to get the pictures home to the real vaults. And then when I get home, I'll move those pictures, that folder either to new, because I still need to work on them if I'm not done or to where they should be. So that's my folder structure. Does that help? Yeah, it sure does. That's great. So we've gotten a few questions about scanning. Um, yeah. So hopefully this question will cover a few of them. So Dan's asking, you showed lots of old photos. Yeah. I bet that some of your old pics, like many of mine, <clears throat> excuse me, were scanned before Milio, and that re you recorded the written information from the back of the pics into meta fields like subject, title, et cetera. How do you personally get that info from your old photo files metadata into your Milio pics or Milio photos? Well, first of all, I'm going to say this is an area of active development for us, although you won't necessarily see the results in a day or a week or even a month. But um, also remember that I've been using Milio since 2014. So all of my scanned pictures went into Milio because I've done all the scanning since 2014, pretty much. Um, when I scan, uh, I scan the front and back if there's anything on the back, and both the front and the back go into Milio. Now, 
today you would have to read that and then use it to put the metadata in. But um, so we already do OCR. So for example, uh, if I scan a picture and I wanna know where the picture was taken and there's a restaurant in there and I, I'm looking for the picture with that restaurant, I can find it because Mylio will read all the writing, whether it's in the picture or not. Now, what Mylio doesn't do yet is read handwriting. And the other thing we don't do yet is many older pictures have a time and date stamp put on them by the camera. And those are both things that we're going to automate. But Miley absolutely will recognize all the faces. And one thing we're working on, again, which is not soon, but will eventually happen, is being able to tell how old somebody is by looking at their face. And that gives us an idea when the picture was taken. And then we're also looking at uh, along with our object recognition, being able to recognize skylines. And that's not just city skylines. It could be mountain skylines, forest skylines. I mean, if you're on the ocean, that's a bit tough. But in many places, if we can recognize the skyline, we can tell where the picture was taken. Okay. All right, David. So let's wrap it up with this last question. Uh, what is your vision for Milio photos in the long term? Well, if you visit our office and you walk in the front door and you look at the wall on the right, the company mission statement is there to change the way the world remembers. So I also think there's this kind of meme um, of the second brain, like our brains get overloaded, you know, and particularly as we get older, it's hard to keep up with all the things that we'd like to remember. It's not even should, just would like to. So, but I think of Milio, first of all, as being a second brain, but I also think it's like a second heart. So when I'm able to see pictures, um, okay, so here's one. This is probably the best way I can explain this. Um, I'm going to go to here, my albums, and I have an album called uh, Favorites. So when I was in Vancouver this weekend, um, I have a five-year-old granddaughter. And again, I'm tempted to start showing pictures of my grandkids and then we'll be late. So that's the only reason I'm not. And on the last evening I was there, she came up to me and said, Granddad, I want to give you a sticker because I love you. Now, my ability... I, you know, I've probably shown that, okay, it's not stupid, that sticker to half a dozen friends just in the last two or three days. This happened last week. And I can do it, you know, on my phone, my tablet, just wherever I am, I can just do it. Now, that picture, that's a memory. It's valuable. Guess what? It's only going to get more valuable. And so I think Milio is the way that it's, in a way, our gift to the world. Yes, you have to learn how to use it. And because it does a lot of things, it can be complicated. But once you learn how to use it, uh, it really becomes like a part of you. And it's helping you with one of the most valuable things in your life, your memories. So I just want to see us continue to get better. If you think about some of the things I've talked about, I know there are questions about NASA's. You know, we plan to do NAS support. I, I want to say one thing. I know we're at the end, but um, it's a tip. So I have a Synology NAS, and actually we have a way of running, of using this, uh, of running in a Synology NAS in a container, but it's not really full Milio. But what I did, I know I'm taking a slightly off your question. I bought a thing called the Nuke. It's made by Intel. It's a very small, very energy efficient, full on Intel computer. And I run Windows on it. It costs a few hundred dollars. And I have it directly attached to the NAS through my LAN through a very high speed interface. And I'm not going to get into the technical details, but effectively, for not very much money uh, compared to the cost of the NAS and all of its disks, I have Milio running on that NAS. So there is a way of doing it today, but we eventually plan to do it. But going beyond that, um, you know, whether it's recognizing how old the face is so we can date your pictures for you automatically, 
or protecting all your pictures because you have multiple vaults or letting you see your pictures wherever you are. You know, my my dream is to keep doing that for all of you and to have the product continue to get better with every release in ways that you care about. Yeah, that's beautifully said. Thanks, David, so much for your inspiration and really for helping all of us to be able to find our precious memories and to be able to back them up and share them with family and friends for many, many years to come. So thank you so much for that. I want to thank everybody for joining us today and also for Angela helping in the background. She did a great job answering some of those other questions for us. We hope that you, if you have any other questions, uh, go ahead and let us know and we'll follow up later on that. This is being recorded, so you'll be able to see it again. Um, David, once again, thank you so much for your insight and for your inspiration. Uh, this is just a wonderful company and looking forward to seeing where Mylia goes uh, in the future here. So thank you so much. Really I want to thank it. all of you for being here. And uh, you should feel free to mail me. My email is david at mylio.com. And I won't try to, you don't have to put in my last name. It's hard to spell, but david mm -hmm. and mylio and com are easy to spell. So feel free to email me with comments, questions, suggestions, whatever. That's great. Thank you so much, David. Okay, everyone, have a great day. And uh, hopeful, hopefully David will have you up again uh, doing another webinar for us maybe in a month or so. Yeah. Uh, that'd be great. Okay, thanks right. everyone. Okay. We'll see you later. Bye bye. Thank Hi, you. Bye everyone. Bye bye.